7th century, the years from 600 to 700, and as I say, one of the themes I'd like to look at briefly here is simply the beginnings of and the rise of the religion that we know of as Islam. And so I am not here as an apologist for Islam, but I hope my presentation will be at least fair, even-handed, if not overly sympathetic. You understand I'm a Presbyterian, but nevertheless, we need to uh, have something of an understanding of where this religion has come from and why it was significant. At the time that Muhammad was born, the Arabian Peninsula was a vast and relatively unpopulated region. It's huge. But at that time, and indeed even today, you'd say that the population is pretty sparsely distributed across it. Most of it is, of course, a vast and dry wilderness, rich in resources, especially these days. We know of oil. Even then, it had resources that were worth uh, using as commodities for trade and so on. The people who lived in the region at that time, and to some degree today as well, were Bedouin. They were, up until the time of Muhammad, polytheistic. They had a religious scheme that went back into the misty, murky past. You really can't try, quite trace the beginnings of it, but characteristic of many people groups at that time and even today, you find a religious pantheon populated by a variety of deities, many of whom were fraught with the same foibles that we are. You know, not perfect deities, not paragons of virtue, but deities that themselves were engaged in all kinds of squabbles and questionable behavior. But this was the general the theological context of these people up until this time. The main cities at that time were the two cities of Mecca and a city that was called Yatrib. So Mecca to the north, Yatrib to the south. That city was renamed by Muhammad during his lifetime Medina, which means something like glorious city or celestial city. So we know them as Mecca and Medina. Medina, however, was given a new name by Muhammad. So these two cities you can see are, are situated more or less to the western side of the Arabian Peninsula, and those black lines that you see on that map represent various trade routes that were commonly used at that time. So again, the Arabian Peninsula itself was not a great place to grow crops or otherwise engage in that kind of agrarian behavior, but they did have resources that could be traded, and that was largely the way in which business was conducted and people were able to sustain themselves. The center of worship at the time was a large object called the Kaaba. This is pretty good size. If you don't know, those, those are people that are down there beneath it, you see. So we're looking at a pretty good sized object there. This was the center of worship before the Islamic religion was born. Nobody knows quite where it came from or how it came to exist. It's sort of like Stonehenge or something. It just has some sort of mysterious history, but there it was and is, and the people who were there in the Arabian Peninsula viewed it as the holiest object, the central sanctuary, if you will, of their religion, albeit a polytheistic religion. And so it was really a centerpiece of their understanding and when Muhammad himself was able to start the Islamic religion, he co-opted that object so that now it's the holiest object of the Islamic religion. When faithful Muslims pray toward Mecca, technically they're praying toward the Kaaba, which is there in the center of that city and is really the object that they're focused on as they're uh, engaged in their prayers. The life of Muhammad itself uh, can be described in terms of his connection to the two cities, Mecca first, then Medina, then back to Mecca. Some of you I know are familiar with this story, but just to make sure we get it on the record, we'll just run through his career rather quickly here. He had a rather tumultuous beginning. His, father, his mother really died when he was very young, and his father died a few years later when he was still a boy. He bounced around, you might say almost like foster care for a while, but wound up with his uncle. And so his uncle cared for him and reared him until he reached adulthood. His uncle was himself engaged in caravan trade. And so this was for the early years of Muhammad, his experience. Again, if you look at this map, you'll notice that there's an arrow that goes up on the left-hand side of the map, heading basically from Mecca up to Damascus. Damascus is the capital of Syria, 
and that was the trade route that was largely used by the uncle of Muhammad, and he himself made that trip on a variety of occasions as a boy and indeed as a teenager. During the time that he made those trips, he came in contact with a Christian monk whose name was Bahira. This Christian monk who lived in Damascus was Arian. Now we've talked about Arianism before. You know that the Arian form of the Christian faith denied the Trinity. This was what was rejected at the Council of Nicaea and again at Constantinople. It affirmed what's sometimes called a hard monotheism, that is a rigorously singular God, no plurality, no trinity of any kind, one God. There was a place, of course, in Arian thought for Christ. He was viewed by the early Arians as the Jewish Messiah. He was viewed as a great prophet, a great religious leader, and indeed, eventually, a highly elevated being worthy of our deep reverence, but not exactly worship. Worship is, is reserved for God alone, but Jesus was, at least in the Arian view, the greatest expression of the truth of God in a kind of prophetic way among us. So this was the character that Muhammad came in contact with, and they formed a fairly close relationship, and indeed, this monk, Bahira, actually himself uttered a kind of prophecy with respect to Muhammad that he himself would become a great prophet. This was said to Muhammad when he was in his teenage years, probably 13, 14, 15 years of age, and it did obviously leave something of an imprint on his mind. I think this connection is very important because you'd have to say, on the face of it, as you, as you look at the fundamental tenets of the Islamic faith, you do see some rather striking correlation between Islamic religion on the one hand and that early Aryan form of Christianity on the other. It's not the same thing, I'm not saying they're indistinguishable, but there's certainly some points where you can see one contributed rather significantly to the other. So in any event, he has that experience as a youth. When he was 25 years old, he married. Up until this time, he'd worked hard, but he seems to have been a very charismatic, bright, likable, winsome sort of person. Everybody liked him. He was illiterate. He couldn't uh, write but he nevertheless had a kind of attractive personality and got the attention of this rather wealthy widow, 15 years his senior. And so, uh, sometime after her husband died, she actually orchestrated circumstances that the two of them would get married. So he, at 25, married her at 40. And it does seem they had a perfectly happy relationship during their years together. But the nice thing about marrying a, a, a rich woman is you can take a few days off, you know? And that's exactly what Muhammad did. He was able to begin living a little bit more of a life of leisure. Now, he was a, a man given to a certain kind of spiritual orientation to life. This seems to be characteristic of him. And so what he did over the next several years, at least as the record of his life seems to indicate, is he spent a fair amount of time by himself in prayer, in reflection, in kind of a religious devotion as he understood it. And I'm sure that even during this time, the instruction that he had received from Bahira was probably still ringing in his ears. But in any event, the story that is told in the Islamic tradition is that at age 40, Muhammad was praying in this particular cave. You can see in Arabic there a little plaque up to the, uh, in the upper part of that, which indicates this was the place where Muhammad was when, in the midst of prayer and devotion, he was visited by the angel Gabriel. And Gabriel came to him and said to him that the religion that was being practiced by the people here and throughout Arabia was misguided and that he, Muhammad, was being called by God to be a prophet of the true religion to these people and to announce to them that there is only one true God that should be the object of their worship. At first, Muhammad was resistant. He didn't want to accept that call. He didn't view himself as a kind of upfront leader, that sort of guy. He consulted with his family, especially his wife and others, and they all came to believe that this indeed was the call of God and that this was what Muhammad should in fact do. And so, after a period of time, he began giving himself to this particular activity. Shortly thereafter, the angel Gabriel dictated to him the document that we know of as the Quran, which is a word that means recitation. As I said, Muhammad himself was illiterate. He didn't write it, 
but he did re-download it, as it were, you know, from the angel Gabriel, and then dictated it to an amanuensis, to a secretary, who took it down, and that, of course, became the holy writing to this day of the Islamic religion. Uh, sometime later, he began preaching openly in Mecca. He was at first more or less ignored. There wasn't a whole lot of interest, and then gradually the effect he was having was to produce a negative reaction so that as he preached, increasingly there was a public opinion that was going against him until in the year 622, he was driven out of the city of Mecca. The Islamic religion reckons 622 as the year zero. And so in their calendar, this is when history began in the modern era. So if you want to know the Islamic year you're in, you always just subtract 622 from whatever the year is we normally think of, and you'll have the Islamic year. The year zero was, at least for Muhammad, apparently kind of a low point, but nevertheless he migrated the some 20 to 30 miles or so from Mecca to Medina to the south, and once again, true to the call of God as he understood it on his life, he began preaching. Only in Medina he got a very different response, and there was a widespread attraction to Muhammad, a great uh, sort of recognition that what he was preaching was some kind of truth that should be followed, at least as they understood it. And so he, he was able to acquire at that point a rather sizable following. And over a couple of years, basically the entire city came to regard Muhammad as a prophet of God, and the entire city was given over to the religion that was being propagated then by Muhammad. The next six years, from 624 to 630, were a series of violent clashes led by Muhammad and armed warriors from the city of Medina against the city of Mecca. Now these weren't major wars, but they were violent skirmishes. It began by attacking caravans that were moving in and out of Mecca. Increasingly, it became attacks on the city of Mecca itself until eventually the city fell to the armed attack that was being brought by Muhammad and those following him. So this was, a, this was truly a, a violent skirmish. It wasn't just you know, powerful preaching that made this happen. Mecca fell in the year 630 to Muhammad and those who were his followers, at which time Muhammad offered to these people the opportunity to convert to the Islamic faith, the very faith that he had been preaching there some few years earlier, and in this case, the Meccans did indeed uh, largely embrace the, 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 the religion that was being uh, preached by Muhammad and turned to this particular approach to religious life, and that was really the, uh, the, the last little chapter of his life then was the two years before his death that he spent back in the city of Mecca. So that's kind of the quick story. Obviously, he didn't live to see the vast expansion of Islamic religion around the world, but he was certainly the major character responsible at the beginning of this. Some of the fundamental teachings, and again, I'll do this very rapidly, but just because we'll be referring back to it as time goes along. The word Islam means submission, and that is probably the central ethical tenet of the Islamic religion, submission to the will of God. The Arabic word for God is Allah, and so it's submission to the will of God, or Allah, and it's an absolute submission. What God calls us to do, we do without question and without reservation. The word Muslim is related to the word Islam, and it simply means one who submits. So a Muslim is one who embraces Islam, you see, and that's the connection between those two words. The Quran, we mentioned earlier, is a word that means recitation. This is a duplicate of the original Quran that was dictated by Muhammad, the holiest book, only in the Arabic language. Translations are not holy. They're worth reading, but if you want to really know the Quran, you need to read it in Arabic. That's true to this day. The five pillars of Islam, you probably know. The creed, the creed is that there is one God and that one God, creator of heaven and earth and all of that, has the final great prophet, Muhammad. Islamic religion recognizes others as prophets. So Moses was a prophet, Noah was a prophet, Jonah was a prophet, Jesus was a prophet, but the last and greatest, the one who deserves our really uh, highest loyalty, of course, and allegiance, 
is Muhammad. So that's fundamentally the creed of the Islamic faith. The prayers five times a day, the very famous image you've all seen of Islamic uh, uh, people bowing toward Mecca and so on. This is part of the uh, practice of Islam. Alms giving, giving to the poor was one of the pillars. The fast that takes place once a year in the season of Ramadan was one of the pillars. And finally, pilgrimage. If a person is able, Muhammad did allow for those who might, by physical incapacity, not be able to do this, but if a person was able to, then at some point in their life, they should make a pilgrimage to the Kaaba in Mecca, the holy sanctuary, the central sanctuary of their worship. Many times people popularly would think that jihad is one of the pillars. It is not. Jihad is not on the list. It is part of the Islamic faith. It's a word that, as you probably know, means a holy war. In the early days of Islam, I think a person can say without much question, it had a very violent kind of character to it. There are, of course, a variety of opinions in contemporary Islam as to what exactly jihad means. And not every Islamic person sees jihad as a violent thing. Some do. We hear of Islamic fundamentalists. They would typically take more of a kind of violent edge to their understanding of jihad, but many are more moderate and would uh, really reject that and say that's not a legitimate expression of the Islamic faith anymore. The more important thing for our purposes now is what happened immediately after the death of Muhammad. The year was 632, and what takes place over the next hundred years or so is a breathtakingly rapid growth of this religion throughout the ancient civilized world. So this is almost a wonder to behold. Of course, Islam begins in this Arabian Peninsula, as we saw earlier, sparsely populated, but over about a 15 to 20 year period, this entire region was more or less dominated by the Islamic religion. I think it has to be pointed out early that this growth of Islam was largely at the point of a sword. This was at this time in history very much a violent kind of expansion of a religious and and philosophical understanding. So this wasn't just people preaching on a street corner and winning converts. There was something a lot more brutally forceful and coercive about the growth of Islam at this time. And so, first of all, it takes over the Arabian Peninsula. From there, they move north and east. So they would move through the region we would call Iraq, the Mesopotamia, east from there into Persia, we would call it Iran, east from there, and bumped up against India. India, of course, is dominated by Hinduism, which had already been there for hundreds of years. And they weren't quite so ready to, you know, just roll over with the onslaught of the Islamic religion. So there were violent clashes that took place, but essentially the Hindu Indians held their own, and that more or less demarcated the eastern expansion of Islam. They didn't make it into India, they certainly didn't dominate India, and I think you're aware that Islam to this day has continued to have a rather tense relationship with Hinduism, and that would be true in the world even you know, today as we're talking about it. So it really began there and has continued unabated throughout uh, the rest of history to this time. Turkey was the first uh, movement to the west. It didn't take all of Turkey, but the region, if you can make it out on that map, north of the Holy Land, north of Syria, up into Turkey. And that's about as far west in the Turkish uh, peninsula, what's called Anatolia, as they got. Then they came down and began to uh, work through Egypt. And again, these were armed Uh, attacks and skirmishes that took place and and much of Egypt at this point was brought under the dominance of the Islamic uh, military force that was coming from there to North Africa, spreading across all of North Africa as far as Morocco on the west. They didn't go south so much at this point, that did come later, but at this point it's more or less the North African region that comes under their control. And then finally, in around the year 700, they move across the Strait of Gibraltar into Spain. And so now we have a population that's Islamic uh, dominating the Iberian Peninsula, which we know of as Spain. The people who came to join the Islamic movement in North Africa were called Berbers, B-E-R-B-E-R, Berbers. And they embraced, they turned from polytheism, they embraced the Islamic faith, and many of them joined in this movement across into Spain, and in Spain they came to be called the Moors. 
And so that's where that term comes from that we've uh, heard, of course. So the Moors were basically Islamic people, mostly Berbers, who were there in Spain, and that became the dominant uh, religion and, and presence there in Spain then for some time to come. All right. This growth, of course, if you are keeping an eye on it, would naturally have kept going north, and the region north of Spain would be France, or what was called Gaul, or what in our story we're calling the Frankish Kingdom. And of course, you know the Frankish Kingdom had been there now for some time. We talked last time, we were together, about Clovis. He, is, he united the Franks. He established the Merovingian dynasty, in which there had been a series of subsequent rulers who had overseen life in France, and they were or in, in the Frankish Kingdom, and they were aligned with the, with the uh, Catholic Church in Rome. So they were Christian, they were Orthodox, as much as anybody in the world was at that point. And the Church and the Frankish Kingdom worked together in a kind of consolidated fashion, supporting each other politically and religiously and so on, and that continued for some time. However, the successors to Clovis were not quite as competent as he, and gradually these men became something like do-nothing kings. And the people that really were beginning to run the Frankish Empire were characters known as the mayor of the palace. The mayor of the palace would be something like a prime minister who really was running the day-to-day -day operation, who was carrying out political policy and that sort of thing. The mayor of the palace in the Frankish kingdom, when the Islamic forces were beginning to invade into Gaul, was a man named Charles Martel. And he confronted these Islamic invaders at a battle known as the Battle of Tours, which took place in 732. So exactly 100 years after the death of Muhammad, you have the expansion of the Islamic uh, forces into Gaul, into the Frankish kingdom, stabbing very deep, I think you'd agree, Tours is way to the north there, and launching their attack. And it was here that Charles Martel, representing the Christian Europeans, you know, marshals an army and goes out against this what appears to be unstoppable force that has already won major victories all through the world and now is apparently going to extend its control into uh, the Frankish world. Well, Charles Martel on this occasion is successful. He looked a lot better then than he does now, but uh, that's uh, the remains of Charles or his sarcophagus. And so he goes out and fights on behalf of the Frankish kingdom and the Christian world generally and indeed is successful in repulsing the Islamic invasion. And they are pushed back and wind up remaining in Spain, where they reside now for the next several hundred years. And so the Spanish world is dominated by the Islamic religion, and this continues for some time. However, as history unfolds, there is a gradual growth of Christian presence in Spain and a gradual reduction of Islamic control in Spain. And if I could picture this on a map, you can just imagine kind of a boundary moving southward. So the Islamic people are increasingly squeezed into the lower or southern part of Spain until finally two very Roman Catholic rulers in Spain in the year 1492 succeed in driving the Islamic forces out entirely of Spain. And those two rulers are, of course, named Ferdinand and Isabella. It's no surprise that it was in 1492 that they indeed succeed in driving out the Islamic presence there in Spain. They'd been dealing with this you know, character from Genoa, Italy, who kept wanting to find the East by sailing West. He'd been there in their courts repeatedly, and they kept putting him off, saying, hey, man, we got other stuff on our plate. We're fighting the Islamic forces. Come back, you know, later. And so the very year that they finally succeed in driving out the Islamic forces, Christopher Columbus once again shows up, and they say, okay, okay, you know, go for it. And they fund his efforts in the Nina and the Pinta and the Santa Maria take off on the uh, trek of Columbus. I'm hoping we can do a little bit on Columbus, but that's much later. I just wanted to round out this story. Obviously, I've skipped over a lot of it. The Crusades we'll deal with separately, but just so you kind of see the, the picture of the growth. All right, so that's Islam, as much as we're going to say about that this morning. I'd like to turn our attention now to the other theme of the morning, which is not unrelated to what we've just described, but uh, there's kind of a tangential connection. And, so on, and this would be the story of Boniface.
Boniface was born in England in the year 680. He was educated in a monastery. Now again, just to kind of keep our time frames in mind, remember last time we talked about Pope Gregory. And you recall that Pope Gregory was very taken with the Anglo-Saxons. And he called them the angels. And he himself wanted to go and be a missionary to them. Remember all that? That's coming back to you. It's two weeks. I know it's a long time, but it's all back in your minds now. He, of course, never made that trip. But he did send a monk missionary to go and become a missionary to the Anglo-Saxons. This took place around the year 600. And that man's name was Augustine, not to be confused with Augustine who is, of course, the earlier theologian. But this Augustine became the first Archbishop of Canterbury, went on a rather perilous journey there into the very heartland of Anglo-Saxon England. The Anglo-Saxon had invaded England over the past 10 years, and indeed for the next two, you know, maybe decade or so. And so the Anglo-Saxon invasion, which generally would be tied to about the year 600, was pushing the Brits, the native population, off into the kind of north and west, Wales, that region, and the Anglo-Saxons came to control about half of the British uh, island there. And so what you've got are the Brits, the original population, sharing now a lot of their island with the Anglo-Saxons. The Brits still had a Christian memory that went back to when the Romans were there and Christian Rome was present. The Anglo-Saxons were pure pagans, you know. And so they came in and this conflict took place. And about the year 600, in very round numbers, we would say the Anglo-Saxons had more or less established themselves there. It was about that time that Augustine showed up and went into the heartland of the Anglo-Saxon world and preached the gospel, a kind of suicide mission. And yet, remarkably enough, these Anglo-Saxons, as bloodthirsty as they were, as idolatrous as they were, upon hearing the rich truth of the Christian message, largely turned from their paganism, turned from their violent ways, and indeed, in large numbers, embraced the Christian faith. So that takes place under the watch of Augustine, for, and he's, his ministry lasts for about 20 years. So from 600 to 620 or so, he's engaged, and really later than that, he's engaged in that kind of activity. So you see, Boniface is born in 680. So he's only still kind of within the first two or three generations of that Christian presence among the Anglo-Saxons. He himself is of Anglo-Saxon extraction. So he's born into that population. His family was not particularly you know, juiced up about being zealous Christians. They were kind of nominally Christian. But he himself seems from an early age to have been deeply possessed of a desire to serve God and give him his, himself to God's service and so on. And so he was educated in a monastery, indeed took the vows of a monk and adopted that life. When he was 36 years old in the year 716, he felt God was calling him to be a missionary to the German Franks. Now again, this is a map of of the Frankish Empire. And you notice the green part is all what was controlled by the Frankish kingdom. But exceptional is right at the top, two regions. One was called the German Franks. That was a region called Frisia. That's off to the left on the map there. And the other was called Saxony, and those were the German Saxons. So you have the Germanic tribes broken down into kind of two subgroups, the Frisians on the one hand, the Franks, German Franks, and then the Saxons on the other. A little bit complicated, but that was a region that remained outside of the Frankish kingdom and still very much given over to a kind of pagan religious practice. And that is where Boniface wanted to go. So he shows up and he surmises after a while the holiest place, the central sanctuary of this pagan religion dominating that region was a, was a mountain called Mount Gutenberg. And so he goes there. And on Mount Gutenberg, there was a huge oak tree. It was called Thor's Oak. And according to the tradition of that belief system, Thor resided there. 
Thor, of course, the pantheon of gods associated with him and so on, were violent, they were bloodthirsty, and Thor was the worst. He'd be kind of like Jupiter or Zeus or something, you know, kind of the chief god. The picture they had of him was a god with a big hammer in his hand who'd fly around in the sky and strike people down. Lightning bolts, hurricanes, and all were said to be under the control of Thor. So that was the image that they had of him. And the oak tree was the place where Thor lived. So it was kind of a scary place, you know. Boniface goes straight to that tree. There were people there, of course, practicing their religious activities, and he simply announces to the people that were there that they should turn from this pagan, idolatrous practice and that they should turn to the worship of the true God, which did not meet with immediate acceptance on the part of these folks. And he said, I'll tell you what, I challenge Thor. And he set a day, maybe three or four year, uh, days later, and said, come back here, and I will openly challenge your God, Thor, in the name of my God, the God of heaven and earth, and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. These people said, he's going to have you for lunch. You know, there's no way. And so, they, so a huge crowd came back on the appointed day. All of these people were up for a good show. They wanted to see lightning. They wanted to see Thor do his stuff. And so Boniface showed up with about a half a dozen monks, and much to the horror of those who were watching, he began chopping away at that oak tree. Thwap, thwap. They all were standing back, you know, where's the lightning? And, that, and, and they just kept chopping. It took about half the day, chipping away a huge oak until finally that tree came thundering down to the ground. And that was the end of Thor's oak. The people were, now, that's risky, you know, to do that. And you have to grant Boniface was kind of out on the edge, but the effect it had was deep and profound and lasting as they realized that Thor, for all of his power, had not been able to stop one puny monk with an ax attacking his great oak. And there was a huge turning at that point of these people in faith in the God that was being announced by Boniface. What Boniface did, as a matter of fact, was preach to them that day, and there were many hundreds of people who were baptized that very day, and thousands more were baptized later and admitted into the Christian church. And Boniface himself used the wood from that oak tree to do two things. To create firewood for himself so he'd survive the coming winter, and to build a church. And the people were pretty impressed to be worshiping the God of heaven and earth in a church that was made out of the oak tree that had once been the object of worship in connection with Thor. So Boniface continued to labor in that region for many, many years. He died in the year five or 754, so for another uh, 35 years or so, he labored among the German Franks and the Saxons. He was, at this time, supported by Charles Martel. You'll notice that the date of Boniface activity there in that region, right in the middle of that date, was the Battle of Tours. And of course, Charles Martel was the dominant political character in that region all during that time. And so while Charles Martel was concerned with the Islamic threat on the one hand, he also was very much given to supporting Boniface on the other, provided money, provided help, provided military care and so on that might be necessary. And all of this was, was formed a very close bond. So Boniface and Charles Martel were pretty good buddies uh, through this time. And both of them working together were able to really uh, create, a, a, once again, a protected area for the Christian message. I might just mention, by the way, uh, most of you know this, but just to anticipate where we're going next time we're together, which is next week, uh, Charles Martel uh, did not become the king of the France, but his son did. So they set aside the Merovingian dynasty and set up what's called the Carolingian dynasty in honor of Carol, Charles, and the successor to Charles Martel was named Pippin the Short. He was about eight feet tall, you know. You always want to be nervous about anybody in the back room called Tiny. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> if you don't settle down, we're going to call Tiny, and you know you're in trouble. You know, well, Pippin the Short was sort of that way, and Pippin the Short had a son who was a huge man by those standards of that day, and his name was, of course, Charlie Maine. And so Charles Martel was the grandfather of Charlemagne, and I'd like to turn our attention next time we're together to the reign of Charlemagne, that great kind of renaissance 
right in the middle of what some people call the Dark Ages uh, that was really centered on that character. But uh, Boniface said of Charles Martel in some of his writings, quote, without the protection of Charles Martel, I could neither administer the church, defend his clergy, nor prevent idolatry. As I say, he, he labored for many years. There was one enclave that remained uh, unconquered by the gospel, and toward the end of his life, Boniface wanted to go to that region. It was in the kind of the western region of Frisia, and these people had remained given to their paganism, to their idolatry, and so Boniface gathers a group of courageous monks, and they go and they establish a kind of camp there in the outskirts of that area, intending to go in and begin preaching to these who still were a little bit outside the reach of their ministry. As they're building their campsite, they happen to glance up on the hill and they see the glint of steel. And they realize that these people are coming and they're not just coming, you know, to have a Starbucks coffee, that they're coming with a certain degree of, uh, of violent interest. And so the monks who were with him, of course, they carried weapons and, and so they began grabbing them and famously uh, Boniface said to them, cease fighting, lay down your arms, for we are told in scripture not to render evil for good but to overcome evil by good. And so these monks put down their arms and they simply unarmed go out and meet these kind of marauding characters who are coming at them and they are all uh, cut to shreds at that point. So the end of Boniface's life was one of violence in which he was martyred along with those who were with him. Tertullian said uh, many, many hundreds of years earlier, the blood of the martyr is the seed of the church. And indeed that did tend to be the case here because even though Boniface paid the ultimate price for his ministry among these people. It wasn't long until they also were succumbed by the effects of the gospel. And so his uh, career was certainly one of great uh, success in that sense. Just to return briefly to my text of the morning, I hope you caught it. Isaiah talks about people that chop down a tree and, and use part of it for firewood and part of it to be become their idol, you know. And of course, what Boniface did was just the opposite. He chopped up down the tree, used part of it for firewood, and used the other wood as a, as a means of worshiping God. And I think it's between the two, Isaiah's you know, critique of those in his day and Boniface's model, I think Boniface obviously wins the contest here. But the question I have for each of us is to what degree are we doing that? You know and I know, now none of you are in this room, but you know people who work and work and scrimp and save and do everything in their power to accumulate the stuff of this world as if those things they're accumulating will become their savior. They figure if they get enough money in the bank by scrimping and saving, that money in the bank will save them. And they fall down before it as Isaiah himself suggested and say, save me, you are my God. People will use their talents, they will use their abilities, their gifts, their genius to create things that they think are their savior rather than realizing these things, these capacities, these gifts were given by the God of heaven and earth just so that they could produce this kind of expression of that which should be to his praise. So, you know, if we are in a position of doing things that are impressive, if we build houses, if we have money in the bank, or if we have success in our career, or if we have this and that, all of these things that people are tempted to worship as if they were the Savior. What we need to do is follow Boniface, who takes a big chunk of the product of that labor and says, I'm going to make this the mechanism of worship. I'm going to make this the means whereby God is honored in my life. I'm going to take half this tree I just chopped down and build a church where people can see the face of God and worship Him so that we have our priorities straight and we're not worshiping sticks and stones, as Isaiah says, blocks of wood of our own creation and fabrication, but rather we're worshiping the God who gave us the capacity to produce these expressions of His blessing in our lives. Thank you.